Um, how has it been for you guys? Like, this is such a huge project and you guys are all kind of a younger cast. Like, what's it like rolling out in this era? It's, it's a lot of fun, both for the best and the worst reasons. Uh, it's a lot of fun because I feel like given the state of things, a lot of people are inside and they're maybe starving for that sort of content, specifically uplifting content. And I feel like where Love Victor sort of provides that sanctity of being able to lose yourself in a new character and a new world, I think people have hopefully really taken to it. Uh, it's also fun in an interesting way because we'll do publicity via a laptop and my internet is shite <laughs> and sometimes it cuts out. Yeah. And it's all, it's all to service a, story, a, you know, a show and story I love. So I, I can't complain. Yeah. Very perfect. Very lucky. Are you guys kind of missing each other? I feel like there was like kind of a camaraderie that grew with you guys. So are you missing out on like I'm reuniting and stuff? I miss them like I miss family members, which is funny because, you know, you've, I, I, it was not even a year ago that I met them for the first time, but something about the immense comfortability, conscientiousness, the thoughtfulness that pervaded through set the entire time, everybody was so close and, you know, connected to one another that when they're gone, you actually feel that remorse and missing that energy. But I talked to them all the time, pretty much every day. I play video games with Michael Cimino, uh, Isabella Ferreira and Anthony Terpel almost on a weekly basis. And that's when we like catch up and make sure everyone's okay. And then Rachel Hilson lives really close to me. So we, you know, obviously socially distant, like check up on each other, make sure we're okay and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's really just about trying to have those connections via, you know, FaceTime or whatnot, just like you would your own friends or your own family members. We just have to do press together sometimes. Yeah, which yeah, is I just work together. That's cool to hear because I feel like on a lot of these like teen shows, you hear about so much like drama. And so, <laughs> yeah, you know, you're... I'm not saying there wasn't any, but I am <laughs> saying that whatever drama there was, we made it through. And... Yeah, yeah, I feel that. I feel that. So were there like chemistry tests or anything to get like the vibe between you guys before you got cast? So there, there certainly were chem reads as, as they were necessary to sort of figure out like how the dynamics between the characters and the actors would work. I actually didn't have any, it was in the very early onset stages of it. It was, I believe it was just me and Ana Ortiz. And then after that, Michael came on and a bunch of people. And I know finding Victor was obviously like a pretty arduous process. They screened however many thousands of young uh, Latinx actors. And they would then read them with Benji's and Mia's. And you have to sort of have that rapport with one another to create like a believable relationship or dynamic. But beyond that, you just do, it's like any workplace relationship. You're not gonna get super close to people just by working with them. You have to go to dinner, you have to talk between you know, lunch breaks and whatnot. After hours, you have to just kind of get to know each other. And I'm lucky and honestly, probably a little spoiled that my castmates are so lovely that it really wasn't a chore. You just talk to them and it comes out naturally. And that's really kind of the hope that it feels effortless to get to know them. And it was, for the most part. How were you introduced to like the whole Love, Simon universe? Did you watch the movie first or read the book? So I did, I did watch the movie and I loved it. It, it hadn't dawned on me. I, I, I wish I read more. I don't read as much <laughs> as I did. But I read the book prior to filming Love, Victor only because after watching the movie and meeting Becky, who's such an amazing person and author in general, uh, that's Becky, Becky Albertalli, uh, that I was like, oh, I should definitely not only read the book, but try and find where the themes and motifs that are present in the book and how we can bring them into the show and movie themselves. And you'd have to let me know. I think we did a pretty good job of like finding that sort of uh, body of work in the show itself, but I uh, honestly, I'm, I'm a big sucker for inclusive content, content that speaks to a broad audience that can maybe teach an audience about themselves and who they are. So 
it's kind of a no brainer when it came out. I was like, oh, this will be great. This will be a fun, you know, touching story that I think will resonate with a lot of people. Hopefully that's the goal. Yeah. And uh, take it from there. <laughs> I love, um, well, first of all, the show and the movie were so, are so like distinctive from each other, which I thought was cool because it would be so easy for you guys to kind of fall into the same. Yeah. Know, yeah. But I also love how, you know, racially diverse it was. And especially, I feel like coming out in this past month where we're being like reminded of so many instances where that wasn't happening. It's See, like, I, I talk about it with Rachel all the time. And we, one of the sentiments that gets echoed a lot in our conversations is how grateful we are that Andrew and Mia specifically are portrayed in a way that I don't necessarily know is very common in the television landscape. Andrew's a very well-off young man. Uh, his father and mother are very well to I don't know if we've told anyone what their professions are and I won't spoil that. <laughs> now. I'll get me in trouble. But I liked that the stereotypes that feel comfortable in a lot of television landscape were kind of done away with and we were able to sort of not only break new ground, but sort of build upon what's already sort of been set in stone, like Will Smith and Fresh Prince. It was very, I, I almost said fresh, but that would have been a disgusting. Uh, that been too, too in yeah, much. Um, but it was sort of prolific in that way that people saw him in that role and in that atmosphere. And then people who maybe were not privy to that style of living for, you know, black people, especially in America, that they were like, oh, they, you're right, this can happen to any type of person. This dynamic can be, you know, can transcend race or any sort of background. And I think in essence, we try to do the same thing in our show is create a conversation of how many different types of backgrounds and walks of life can sort of mesh and meld in the high school format. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I've never seen like a black girl as like the the popular Q one too. So uh, that was new. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And yeah. Rachel does it so well. Despite she 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 says all the time. She's like, it's funny. I wasn't Mia in high school, and I certainly wasn't Andrew. But to have those to step into those dynamics, knowing or using what you saw, maybe the white kids or the other kids at school would do, and then portray it yourself is very cathartic. It's funny. Yeah. That's so Reclaiming it. Nice. <laughs> who would you say, which character would you say in your high school version yourself aligned with the most? Oh boy, honestly, probably Felix. Uh, I <laughs> love that kid. He's, he's so cute. I, and I think, unfortunately, I would say I was closer to like a Felix if instead of excited and excitable about every positive thing that comes his way, He's very, he would be par very put off by the negative things that ultimately come with life. I was a very cynical, <laughs> cranky young man. And it wasn't until I became an adult that I probably morphed more into, I don't know if you saw Booksmart, but Nick, that character was very close to my mindset of like positivity rules throughout. And as I became an adult, I was like, oh, that's probably a better way to live, to be more positive and loving than, uh, cranky and upset yeah do you find it like funny you're put into these like roles like nick and andrew where you're like the you know the head honcho type guy <laughs> In intensely it's it's funny because i always say i actually feel i'm pretty well equipped to play those characters when i wasn't that at all in high school because i was able to look at them objectively mm -hmm. those kids that were popular and cool or mean or uh, universally loved because I watched how they moved and I was like, what is it that makes them so desirable? Why do so many people love to be around them? And as I got older, I realized, oh, it's because they have confidence. It's because they are positive. It's because they, you know, include others or they, and that then puts me in a mindset where it's like, oh, I can be those characters because I was victimized or I was uplifted by them in my high school career that I kind of have that sort of from without from within type of mentality. That's really cool because I feel like you do like nail the mannerisms of like. You're funny. Yeah, it's because I was bullied by all of them all the time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can identify. That's good. Yeah. But um, I really saw a lot of like 
kind of like 80s themes in some parts. Like, I really loved that little Breakfast Club episode y'all had. It was great with Ali Wong. She's so cool. She's the sweetest, the most, and that's funny. I, I don't know if I've talked about her as much as I like, is indicative of how much I love her. She is oh. an amazing comedian and actress in general that working with her is just this fun, collaborative, energetic experience that I, I wouldn't trade for anything. She's incredible. Yeah, it was a great little aspect. Were there any, like, I feel like the teen show, like I said, like, there's so many just, like, classic things that go alongside with it. But, like, are there, were there any things that you guys, or projects that you guys took inspiration from, characters in movies or TV shows that you guys kind of, like, took some parts of? Of course. You know, it's funny that you're more social than I, I never even thought to ask my castmates of that question. But yet certainly in the in the conception of the film and the way it was shot and the production side of things, um, a lot of, you know, inspiration came from those movies like uh, Breakfast Club or, you know, Sixteen Candles and that sort of, you know, dynamic. Also, 90s films, I should mention, also played a heavy hand. But it's funny when I create characters or have that sort of rapport, especially with directors and other creatives. A lot of times I'm hesitant to use existing characters because I feel like that can pigeonhole my mentality to be something that's already been created and crafted. A lot of times I actually call upon like music and I use a lot of sonically driven resonance in my, you know, work ethic. I'm trying not to sound super actory, if that makes sense. Process, like crap, my character. I have a headache. But um, it, it, a lot of times I'll let, like a bit for um, Andrew specifically as it relates to, am I allowed to spoil stuff at all? Or is that, am I? I think you're good. I feel like people are like post, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> post watch kind of thing. Exactly. When, Dealing with Mia and Andrew and their romantic side, I, on repeat, would listen. You know who Leon Bridges is? Yeah. Uh, his song, Forgive You, I think sonically and thematically resonate a lot with how Andrew and Mia interact with one another. So I would, between scenes, uh, if I'm in my trailer, or if I'm sitting waiting to you know, be called upon, I would listen to that song on repeat and have that sort of mentality and that be process as we would interact and again it, you'd have to let me know if it worked uh <laughs> that's a very edgar wright type of like preparation process i feel like shaping around this song. he's a cinephile <laughs> oh could be. i can yeah i can reference one thing but um i feel like um i was gonna say oh what what would andrew's like favorite artist be then if you're thinking in that kind of way I mean, he, he would probably, though that is a good question. It sounds like he would probably listen to like Young Thug. I feel or, like like a future type of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. Which is funny because I didn't, I tried to stay away from, you know, like the, the trap or the, the like authentic new age hip hop mm -hmm. while doing a lot of, because a lot of the scenes required a certain level of like, it's hard, like a, a low frequency resonance. And I feel like if I came into it with the confidence and the drip and the, the energy of a young thug or a future, it might overshadow the, I guess, nuance that's present in the scene. However, when we filmed those basketball scenes, that all, that's all we were listening to. I, I, the song Killed Before by Young Thug, that song got pumped through those speakers <laughs> pretty much all day. Um, I'm trying to think of other, I mean, future, the album Future Did with Drake basically just stayed on repeat the entire time. But um, I digress. Uh, probably a future Young Doug Migos. It's very cool basketball team type five, I feel like. I was in high school once. What happened? I was in high school once. I know. I feel like watching this, I graduated in 2016 from high school. And I, I was like, I feel so old. I'm <laughs> like, I feel like this is. You graduated 2016. So yeah. You're... Yeah, I graduated 2015. Oh, you're not much. You, <laughs> you made it sound like you're like reminiscing just now. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> that was funny that like, but to me, I still consider myself in a lot of ways like a big kid. Yeah. Does that make 
Yeah, yeah. So when I hear people be like, oh, like I graduated this year, I'm just like, oh, you're right. That was si that's like six years ago, five years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you go through TikTok, it'll make you feel a little aged. I'm like. I try not to. Although I guess they're banning TikTok or something I now. I know. I'm like, the kids are going to. Yeah, oh, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the kids are resort kids are woke these days they'll figure yeah, it out yeah yeah yeah. I lo i'm loving gen i claim gen z personally i'm I th as you I'm, should you I should i'm a part of it because i think what's the cut the cutoff is like 95 or something yeah, 90. so so i count <laughs> i'm like <laughs> no <laughs> half I, mean, it's, I saw this uh, no, i'm sorry we're so off track but no, i saw <laughs> this video uh where it was like millennials react to blah 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 and one of the and i i used to think i was a millennial because yeah. i didn't know the time frame and one of the gentlemen talking was like had male pattern baldness like he was at them and i was like oh my god like millennials are adults now yeah, like, yeah, yeah they're fully grown people don't want to know, but they'll like be on tiktok still like, you guys should maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe something other than tiktok but yeah. i'm so I can't, I can't. I feel like, yeah, you, you count as Gen Z too. I feel like this whole cast is. Yeah, it pretty, yeah, I, yeah. I'd say so. So with your character, I feel like there's so much room for growth and there've been so many like little, you know, nuggets put here and there about him. So where do you kind of see him going and where do you hope he ends up maybe next season? I see, I hope selfishly I just hope he he has friends because I love filming with the cast and being around them and being in that atmosphere and dynamic but given the way things ended in season one I don't know if that's necessarily in the cards but looking more pragmatically and like how I think things will actually I hope I use that word right anyway yeah, um, sometimes <laughs> <figure it out. laughs> um uh, I feel like he'll maybe practically was the Looking practically at it, I feel like Andrew will probably end up wrestling with his feelings with Mia and trying to respect her decision to maybe want to, you know, figure things out with her fallout and Victor and like how she's feeling following that. I think there is a newfound level of empathy in Andrew that will incite his character moving forward. And it's just a matter of how the, the, the showrunners and the writers want to sort of develop that in the character. I hope, again, he gets some friends out of it. But if not, I'm just happy to be a part, honestly. I'm just happy to be there. Yeah, exactly. I love how outing Victor wasn't even like, um, wasn't even a process in his mind. He was an equal opportunity kind of. See, that was, that was I think, one of the more important aspects to see from Andrew in the entire series is that he though maybe lacked a certain level of empathy and accountability in the beginning of the show, one thing he remained steadfast and never, you know, partaking in is the outing or the discussion of someone else's ident self identity and uh, self expression and sexual orientation, because that's really none of his business. And that's like a memo to anyone watching this that may think it is their business. It is none of your business. How you, react to someone else's, you know, love and their ideas of romance and, you know, partnership has virtually nothing to do with you. So why you would take it upon yourself to uh, express their sentiments unto other people is ridiculous. So he's right. And hopefully that echoes onto the audience. Yeah, I think it's a good like baseline to start a character at. it's like i hope so, I hope so. <laughs> and um last question so for you guys what is the filming season two schedule looking like like how's that gonna go yeah. on yeah. Uh, the unfortunate part is that normally i would lie and say i don't know you never know but i kind of have to tell the truth and say i don't really know given the state of things but um I know they're working on it, they're thinking about it, they're talking about story threads. And as an actor who's sort of not privy to the entire inner workings of how season two is going to work, all I can do is say that I've been connecting with my castmates and people in and around the LGBT plus community, hearing what they think about the show and how we could improve and 
you know, build upon the ideas, narratives, and stories and walks of life we've touched on so far and see how we can enhance that in the next season. But it's all, it's all, it all remains to be seen. It's how, it's how, uh, however Corona Chan wants to <laughs> progress and, uh, you know, it's, it's uncertain times. But unprecedented. Yeah, that word, I, I'm, I can't hear it ever again. <laughs> unprecedented ever again. I'm so something unprecedented once in my life. That's a funny, that was funny. What you just said, I love that. You're right. We shouldn't hear that word anymore. <laughs> but thank you so much for talking to me today. I loved your character. I loved his graffiti. Rewrite. It was great, and I'm that so. One I won't take up too much of your time. That was the one thing I thought people were going to kill me for is how bad my handwriting is. Was that your handwriting? Or was that that? I was like, so bad. I, I was. It was. I read. I could read what was going on there. <laughs> this is legible. I'll take it. I'll take I, it. I knew what was being said. I thought like I usually. I don't know why. This is something I thought of when I'm watching movies. I'm like, when people are writing in their diaries, I'm just like, who's writing that? Like. Yeah. See, I think sometimes it is like the prop master yeah. or something. But for this, they were like, "Do you want to write it?" And I was like, "Sure." Not on sense. Look at him. That's okay. <laughs> it's all part of it, but you know, just a part of the acting process. But thank you so much for talking to me today. I'm so excited for season two. Whenever, whenever y'all are allowed to film it. <laughs>